Because Cuba was just 90 miles south of Florida, and its population was largely Catholic and included Americans, the United States took an intense interest in the inner workings of that island. In 1895, as Cuba was fighting for its independence from Spain, the tabloid press in America continuously reported the story, often noting the horrors of Spanish repression against Cuba. And these deeply upset Americans for social reasons, for religious reasons, for political reasons, and also in part for economic reasons. Uh, Cuba was an important nearby trading partner. Uh, people in the U.S. start increasingly calling for intervention into events in Cuba. In 1898, President William McKinley decided to send the battleship USS Maine to Cuba to protect Americans and American businesses. That ship had been sent by McKinley to Havana in January 1898 to protect American interests and also to be there in case Americans needed to evacuate the city. The ship explodes. Um, at the time, everyone thought and the newspapers reported that it had been attacked, that it had been bombed by the Spanish. A much later investigation, actually in 1976, confirmed uh, what many people in the Navy, even then, some of them actually thought which was that it was an internal explosion to the ship itself. The details may have been murky, but the tabloid press called for a war against Spain. The sensational headlines and thinly reported stories came to be known as yellow journalism, named for the yellow ink used in a cartoon in one of the newspapers, Joseph Pulitzer's New York World. The sensational coverage by the tabloids spread anti-Spain sentiment throughout the United States. At first, President McKinley hesitated to take action, but the pressure to go to war with Spain mounted. The combination of events and the rolling pattern toward war made war almost inevitable. And immediately after the explosion of the Maine, Congress gives McKinley a, a unanimous uh, declaration urging him to respond. And a few weeks later, he goes back and asks for a formal declaration of war, and that passes easily in April of 1898. Soon, the war with Spain escalated beyond the Caribbean and into the Pacific Ocean. Admiral Dewey was ordered to attack the Spanish fleet at Manila Bay in the Philippines, another of Spain's territories. He accomplished this quite easily, only a few weeks after Congress declared war. The initial war with Spain was a war, in many ways, to liberate Cuba. And only later did it become a war to acquire the Spanish Empire. Philippines is a turning point in that moment. The U.S. Navy primarily conquers the Philippines quite easily in 1898. By the end of the war with Spain, six months later, the United States had control of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippine Islands. A little short little video there, of course, on the Spanish-American War, uh, of course, which I'll pretty much go into detail today, lecture-wise, because of course, we're talking about the period of U.S. imperialism kind of beginning uh, in the late 19th century. So anyway, I want to welcome you back, of course, to uh, History uh, 2023. Uh, of course, hope you're having a great week out there. Uh, of course, this is my uh, second lecture of the week, uh, which, of course, will deal with this period. Uh, but I also am going to be getting into talking a little bit about the Teddy Roosevelt era. Teddy Roosevelt's going to come in as president right after the war. And as you know, Teddy Roosevelt was a major war hero. Of course, he was involved in the Spanish-American War with the Rough Riders that, of course, fought in Cuba. So anyway, I hope you're doing great out there. Uh, I don't know, it's like there's anybody on there right now. Uh, well, it looks like it today. Uh, but um, I did want to remind you, of course, before we get started today, uh, you do have some assignments, which are, of course, still up. Uh, I think the main one you have got right now. Uh, Lecture-wise, of course, it's the one on the Gilded Age, of course, in the Old West quiz. I believe that's coming to an end pretty much this weekend. Uh, so you need to kind of wrap that up uh, if you can. Because uh, next week, uh, I am going to be, of course, giving you your first exam, uh, of course, which the uh, historical topics I've kind of already given you to already. Uh, you may have seen that in a few announcements I've given out. Uh, but uh, we'll probably get it to you next week, next Tuesday. Because uh, I'm kind of still working on the um, exam right now. So I'm in kind of in the middle of it. Uh, however, I told you it's not going to have as much material in it. I think it's got like maybe four lectures uh, that'll be part of the 
first exam. So it's kind of like a mini quiz, really, uh, is what it'll be. So um, looks like Ross joining us again. Hey, good, good, good afternoon. Hope you're doing great, of course, today. Uh, of course, so like I said, we're going to be, of course, talking about the mostly the Spanish American War, of course, the aftermath, of course, after that as well. So if anybody wants to join me uh, in StreamYard, there it is, StreamYard.com. Of course, there's the link, uh, of course, where I'm streaming for from. And uh, also, um, if uh, you have any comments, questions, of course, about the lecture or during the live stream, uh, let me know. Or most of you, of course, watching it, of course, recorded. Uh, you, of course, can ask me comments, questions about the lecture, of course, on my YouTube channel um, that you get bonus for. So uh, anyway, um, so previously, I believe before we had been talking about um, the Maine, right? USS Maine, of course, we had kind of started to talk about Cuba uh, and how the Spanish-American War, of course, broke out. Uh, in 1898, uh, and I think we had kind of gone into, we were talking about how the United States was becoming this imperial power, like all these other, you know, major powers in the world, like Britain, because we were heavily influenced by the British, you know, to become kind of an imperial power, uh, and so, yeah, Cuba was in, in the middle of all these, like, they talked about that 1895 revolution that had broken out, and of course, they sent that guy down there, General Weiler, you know, the butcher, to put it down. And so William McKinley sent the USS Maine down there to protect Americans' lives and property uh, from being threatened. I think I told you la last class, of course, last lecture, that the USS Maine blew up in Havana Harbor. You can see, of course, the picture of the Maine right there. That's what it is. February 15th, 1898. Well, and, of course, this angered a lot of Americans. And I told you the rallying cry, of course, you know, for the war was remember the Maine to hell with Spain. Uh, so all these Americans, you know, basically wanted to get involved uh, in the war. Now, the only thing is, though, was that McKinley really didn't want to intervene uh, in the war, like at the beginning. That's the thing that's funny about it. So you can see the amount of sailors that maybe died, 266, which, remember the video talked about how they believe that it was caused by an accident. Uh, which, of course, ended up being, they, they do think it was some kind of internal explosion that was inside probably the magazine that caused it to explode. Uh, and so um, at first, people didn't know that. Now, even the newspapers kind of probably exaggerated and said that the it was an underwater sub, it's kind of like a mine uh, that blew it up. And uh, But McKinley refused to intervene. Uh, he wanted to basically... Uh, he preferred to use American diplomacy you know, between America and, and Spain uh, to try to avoid uh, any kind of war. Uh, they believe that the reason why he did this was because he was kind of concerned that if we got into war, uh, that it would cause like an economic downturn, like maybe another depression uh, like they had before or a financial panic. Uh, but, of course, he received a lot of criticism uh, from, from a, lot of, a lot of citizens, oh, including Teddy Roosevelt who said famously about McKinley that McKinley, uh, that President McKinley has no more backbone than a chocolate eclair. That was his famous quote. Uh, and, um, and so what McKinley eventually decided to do was they decided to give uh, Spain an ultimatum, which they issued to them in March of 1898. Uh, and it had three parts to it, by the way. The first part was that basically they had to end Cuban Revolution that was going on since what 1895 some kind of armistice signed between Spanish and the rebels that are fighting in Cuba for independence to negotiate for some kind of Cuban independence, or maybe if not that some kind of self government that they could have uh, as well. So that was an idea and get rid of those reconcentration camps as they called them, which were concentration camps where they were putting Cubans in there. And so that was pretty much the, the, you know, what they tried to do initially, but the problem was that there was members of, of Congress that were kind of like war hawks that wanted to go, go to war with Spain. They saw this as a wonderful opportunity, like to expand the country, uh, take territory from the Spanish. They saw us being a weak country. And so basically, eventually, that's what happened in April 11th, 1898. Congress eventually, you know, declared, declared war uh, on Spain. So 
that's basically, you know, pretty much how, you know, the United States got in the war uh, at that point, uh, starting the Spanish-American War, which we'll get to in a second, is a very short war, of course, that, that does occur. Now, they also got this other thing that's very famous, you know, at the beginning of the Spanish-American War, you may have heard about it. They had this thing called the Teller Amendment uh, that came out. The Teller Amendment was this thing that was uh, developed by Henry Teller. He was the senator, senator of Colorado. He was kind of this anti-imperialist, anti-expansionist uh, type politician. And uh, what the Teller Amendment was, it was a joint resolution of Congress that called for Cuban independence that they would be independent. Uh, and they also said that we would not annex it. Like we weren't going to go into Cuba and take it over and add it to the United States like we'd done, like, I guess, Alaska, I guess, in Hawaii, I guess, whatever, at that point. Uh, and so uh, that's what it was. But interesting thing about it, Teller Amendment, it didn't say anything about other territories that were controlled by uh, the Spanish like Puerto Rico, Philippines, uh, other islands, of course, in the Pacific. And so, yeah, we took advantage of that, as you know, uh, of course, during the war because of the fact that the Spanish were kind of a weak power and we, we beat them pretty good uh, in this war, as you'll see. Now, again, of course, get into, of course, the fact that the Spanish-American War had a nickname. It was called the Little Splendid War. Sp yeah, Splendid Little War. And Splendid Little War... Um, the reason why I caught that uh, is basically the fact that um, it was such a easy war. It was so splendid, I guess, that we were able to you know, easily defeat the Spanish and get so much prestige out of it, so much you know, territory out of it uh, in such a short amount of time. Uh, and um, the man that coined it was the Secretary of State. He called it splendid, you know, um, which was... John Hay, who was the Secretary of State, he kind of, of course, made made up that quote. Which I think I've got a slide on that. Maybe I can show you what he actually said. It's part of a quote he said about the war itself. You can see it was very short. It considered like one of the most shortest wars in American history. It only lasted like around less than three months. I think the other like the other conflict was real short. Was like the Gulf War, which was in 1991 lasted something like six, seven months. It was a very, very short war. And um, so it's very, very called, called that because we got so much out of it, you know, and didn't spend a whole lot of money uh, compared to other wars. You can see all the areas where we fought. We fought on Cuba. We fought in Puerto Rico, fought in Guam. We also fought in the Philippines. Uh, all those we would take over, of course, except Cuba. Uh, we also took over Wake Island which is in the Pacific, which the Spanish also controlled uh, as well. Now, before uh, the war broke out, uh, what we're like when it's really starting to get, you know, take off at that point, the Congress, like U.S. Congress created this, um, like an act to basically support some of the troops that went in there, uh, of course, to fight. A lot of the troops that went to, um, to Cuba were volunteer forces. And so they had this act called the Volunteer Army Act that was created in April of 1898, right after war was declared. And what it did was it uh, was this act that basically asked for volunteers to, to come fight, of course, against the Spanish. Uh, and it set up a lot of these volunteer cavalry organizations like the first volunteer cavalry um, that they called it. And, of course, the uh, Yellow Press called, called them the so-called Rough Riders. That's what they dubbed them. And um, the amount of Americans, by the way, that volunteered uh, for the war was something like 270,000 Americans decided they were going to fight uh, in the Spanish-American War. About 10,000, by the way, were African-American that joined up, so-called Buffalo Soldiers, as they were called. And uh, you can see the amount of deaths in the war were not that much, about four or 5,000 killed, wounded. Most people died in the war, of course, from disease, uh, like ma malaria, et cetera. Uh, and so I think the casualty rates were pretty lopsided in the war. 
And like I said, we, we beat the Spanish pretty bad uh, in this war. Uh, of course, you can see Theodore Roosevelt or Teddy Roosevelt, as, as he's called. Of course, Teddy is big nickname or TR. He, of course, at the time was the assistant secretary of the Navy. He actually volunteered and joined, of course, the Rough Riders and became one of the two main commanders of it. Him and this other man named Leonard Wood uh, was also involved. Uh, originally, the, the actual cal uh, cavalry unit was called Wood's Weary Walkers. That's what they called themselves. And they didn't have horses. Actually went over there without horses, basically. I think maybe I thought Teddy had a horse, I believe. But um, Teddy Roosevelt would become a major hero uh, in this war. You know, he, he would help him, you know, propel him uh, into various political positions. Governor of New York, vice president. And then eventually president in a matter of like something like three years or so, he went from being nobody to somebody overnight. It's just amazing how he was able to do that. Uh, and so now I'll get more into Teddy Roosevelt. We should have time today to kind of talk about, you know, how he came to power and, and also um, a little bit about his administration when he's, of course, president from 1901 uh, to 1909. Now, let me also talk about some of the early conflicts. Here's that little, by the way, um, quote right there. Yeah, it was a splendid little war, begun with highest motives, carried on with magnificent intelligence and spirit. So that's basically, of course, the famous quote and where they get the term splendid and little war from. And I'll get to uh, Hay later. John Hay was later famous for the open door policy with China. You may have heard about that uh, also as well. There, of course, is Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, of course, they're going to gain fame later for storming San Juan Hill, uh, which is the heights around Santiago, of course, in Cuba. But if you read about, of course, the Spanish-American War, the first big conflict that really occurs uh, in part of this war is the Battle of Manila Bay, uh, which happened uh, in, um, I think I've got the date, I think it was May 1st, of 1898. It's really your first big engagement uh, you have of the war. And apparently before um, Teddy Roosevelt resigned as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he wired uh, to George uh, Dewey, uh, who was command of the uh, Asiatic fleet, fleet, which I think was basically in Hong Kong uh, in, in China at the time. He was asked to basically attack the Philippines. Uh, to try to take out the Spanish Navy uh, that was there. So the Manila Bay is considered the first you know, conflict of the war. U.S. Navy fights the Spanish Spanish Navy. And it was really a lopsided battle. It was really not much of a battle at all. And uh, on the night of, uh, I believe it's uh, April the 30th, what happened was uh, George Dewey, uh, later called the so-called hero of Manila, Manila uh, sailed his fleet uh, into Manila Bay. Uh, past Corregidor, uh, and um, anyway, the Spanish fleet at dawn didn't even know they were there, uh, and they basically, their whole fleet, which I think was, I think their fleet had about, um, I forget how many ships they had, I think I want to say they had like five or six ships they had or more, uh, they got all sunk, their whole fleet was just sunk, basically, uh, and uh, only nine uh, so, uh, sailors actually were wounded in the battle. I think one actually died, uh, which was uh, of heat stroke or something. It was a real lopsided battle, uh, pretty much. Uh, the Battle of Manila Bay is famous for a quote by George Dewey. It might have been one of the first famous quotes uh, for the U.S. Navy since the Civil War, which I think Farragut had that, you know, damn the torpedoes. Remember that Battle of, battle of Mobile they have heard of, but the Famous quote that um, that Dewey said uh, at the beginning of the battle was he turned to his uh, flagship officer, captain of the, I think the USS Olympia, I believe it was. And he told him, he said something like, you may fire when ready, Gridley. <laughs> and that was the big quote uh, that he's kind of known for, uh, Dewey. Dewey, by the way, was a commodore at the time, but after the, after the war, he later was, of course, admiral, uh, which he is now. Uh, later, they're going to have what they call the, um, they have this Filipino conflict later they have. It takes them a while to take actually over the Philippines. Like, it's not to like August because they don't have enough forces 
because they got to land forces in the Philippines, like the U.S. Army and Marines and all that. Uh, and so um, for a while, what happened was the Americans got help from like these Filipino rebels, uh, which were led by Emilio Aguinaldo. You may have heard of him. And I think at one point was like the first president of the Philippines, like later on. Uh, and um, anyway, um, that particular conflict turned around later, like after we took over the Philippines, Aguinaldo realized that the Americans were just as bad as the Spanish. We were also imperialists too. So he started fighting us as well. And so that led to the so-called American-Filipino War. Of course, that came later, 1899 to 1901. We had to send in thousands of troops in there uh, to basically – take control of the Philippines. Uh, and um, we spent something like $800 million like going in there to basically take control of the Philippines. They later joked it was called the Billion Dollar War. That's what they called it. Uh, we had something like 120,000 troops were actually sent at one point to the Philippines. Like Not just that, but African-American troops also, like Buffalo soldiers, also fought in the war as well. And uh, most of the deaths, though, were due to, like, disease. Like, a lot of the Filipinos, uh, the amount of deaths uh, in, in the actual conflict was something like anywhere from a quarter of a million to a million people died of disease and famine uh, because of it. And um, if you know about the Philippines, they won't really get their independence until after World War II uh, in 1946. Uh, they even got occupied by the Japanese uh, during World War II. And, and Douglas MacArthur had to go in and take them out. The Japanese had took it over, which we'll talk about later. So that's kind of what happened to the Philippines, but it's just a while, like I said, it takes us a while to basically take it over, uh, more or less. But obviously, the Philippines are now an independent nation, of course, today. Now, uh, also, the uh, here's a picture, by the way, of George Dewey. I was just talking about the so-called hero of Manila, uh, which is right here, but Let's talk about, of course, the situation with Cuba. Now, as all this is going on, like in the West, in the Pacific with the Philippines, uh, what happened was the uh, Spanish sent in like um, like part of their Navy to try to protect uh, what is Santiago. Uh, and that, that leads to the U.S. We go in and we start blockading Cuba uh, with our naval force. So you can see that's kind of what that is on the left. Uh, right here, uh, where it's blockaded. If you look right here, it's kind of a blockade they put up right here. And to prevent the Spanish, but the Spanish were able to come in there with some naval forces. Uh, and so what happened was the U.S. Navy went in there, uh, attacked them. And as they, as they went in there, they, the Spanish realized they're kind of outnumbered. And so they tried to run, basically take off their fleet. Uh, and it led to the so-called Battle of Santiago or Santiago de Cuba, which happened on July 3rd, 1898. Uh, and in that battle, we had like, um, I think we had mostly six ships, uh, four battleships and two uh, heavy cruisers. Uh, the Spanish had only about six ships, which were cruisers, like four cruisers and two destroyers. They're outgunned, of course, in that battle. And they got just their whole fleet was sunk uh, by the, Amer the U.S. Navy, uh, almost 500 casualties. Uh, we had two men get killed or wounded. I think one guy was killed, one guy wounded uh, in the battle. And uh, the most famous ship that uh, was involved uh, in the um, attack was the um, so-called USS Olympia, which you see right here. Uh, it was involved in the Battle of uh, Santiago de, de Cuba. Uh, and um, it's now still around today. It's, of course, now a famous museum ship in the United States that you're looking at. So that's kind of like a pre-dreadnought uh, battleship, uh, which um, I think it was like Indiana class, I want to say, is maybe what it was. But that's like some of the early ships that they had uh, back in those days. Now, uh, what happened, of course, next, of course, um, we're going to, of course, talk about Cuba. Uh, what happens now, the United States sends forces from what is Tampa Bay. That's where most of our forces uh, de-embarked, basically. So de-embarked from like Tampa Bay. 
And uh, we eventually sail down there. We land on the uh, kind of like on the southern coast of Cuba, a place called Daiquiri. You've heard of that, wherever this Daiquiri drink came from, where the name came from originally. And uh, the, the troops themselves were led by this general named William Shafter, who, by the way, was named Pecos Bill. He's actually from Michigan, but I think he had had some appointments in Texas. He was an Indian fighter. I believe he fought in the Civil War as well, Shafter. And uh, so you have like the Rough Riders under them and all that with the U.S. Army, but Shafter is the one that was the actual main main uh, general that basically led all the forces uh, over there. I do have a picture of Shafter, which is right here. Uh, and um, Shafter, he was kind of comical about him. I don't know if you've heard about him, but he had this, he was like really fat. It was kind of a problem. And so he was so fat that he couldn't ride on a horse. So they, they found this door and they kind of, kind of rode around on a door. Or people just kind of held it, <laughs> you know, they kind of carried him around. He's just a big guy. Uh, and uh, so he had him. He was five, he was one of their main generals. They also had some ex-Confederates uh, also in the war that fought, too, that had been in the Civil War. Fighting Joe. You heard of him? Fighting Joe Wheeler, Joseph Wheeler, uh, who had been a cavalry commander of the Confederates in uh, Tennessee. Then Fett Hugh Lee, who was a nephew of Robert Lee, who fought mostly Virginia uh, during the Civil War was also involved as well. Uh, Joe Wheeler was kind of comical. He His memory was lapsed. He, he kind of sometimes would be out of it because he was so old. Uh, and uh, sometimes in the middle of a battle, um, Wheeler would lapse and forget he was fighting the, the Spanish. He would say, we got the damn ya Yankees on the run. Like, oh, wait, I mean the Spanish. Oops. <laughs> and uh, But yeah, yeah, like ex-Confederates, you know, fighting also in the war that kind of, volunteered that also fought, you know, as well. So it's interesting about that that was going on. Now, of course, the big thing that happened, if you know about it, you have the so-called Rough Riders. Uh, that, of course, got their claim to fame, uh, of course, in Teddy Roosevelt. There's, of course, Teddy Roosevelt. And there's a picture of some of the Rough Riders, Teddy with some of them, of course, with that picture there with the American flag uh, behind them. Uh, they were involved in the most strategic really battles of the whole war uh, in Cuba. And of course, that was the battles of El Cane in San Juan Hill, which mostly happened around July 1st, 1898. San Juan Hill is actually Kettle Hill. I don't know if you know that or not, uh, but actually the hill they fought on was actually called Kettle Hill, but they got the name wrong. They called it San Juan Hill. But usually called the Battle of San Juan Heights is the other name that they called it, and uh, they badly outnumbered the, the Spanish. The Spanish only had like some like 500 troops that were really guarding Santiago. I think the Americans had like, I don't forget how many it was, they had over 8,000 troops. So they were obviously outnumbered and outgunned, uh, basically. And what happened in the battle was that uh, basically um, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, along with uh, these two African American units, the 9th and 10th Cavalry units, you know, which were, by the way, Buffalo soldiers, you know, led by John Pershing, who's a famous general later uh, as well. Uh, and um, they stormed the heights, uh, basically, with them uh, and uh, easily take it. And within a few days later, like a week, uh, two weeks later or so, what happened was the Spanish surrendered on July 17th. 1898. I think at the time, Santiago was one of the main cities or capitals in Cuba. And um, the U.S. won the war with low casualties because uh, most people pretty much died of disease. Uh, the amount of, I think they say the amount of people killed in the battle, I think it was only like 140 something men were, were actually killed in the battle. Like very few. It's not that many. Uh, they were killed. Uh, mostly everybody was wounded. I think he had 1,200 something, 12, yeah, 1,200 maybe that were killed and wounded basically in the battle. And everybody else later died of some kind of disease like malaria or typhoid fever or something like that, uh, more or less. So easy victory. And like I said, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, became this instant hero, you know, after the war uh, because of it. And you're going to see later uh, that he'll use that, like I said, to propel himself to, you know, into power uh, politically in the United States, uh, which is true about that. 
Now, also, uh, one thing that's very famous, too, about they always talk about the um, uh, Spanish-American War was they had a bunch of doctors that went down there and discovered various illnesses that, of course, they think were caused by mosquitoes, like certain mosquitoes uh, overall. And, of course, the most famous for us was this uh, famous uh, American uh, army doctor named Walter Reed. Uh, who you may have heard of or, been, of course, heard of the hospital, famous hospital in Washington, of course, Army Hospital named after him, of course, today. He went down there and he did experiments trying to figure out, you know, which mosquito it was uh, that was causing a lot of the different, you know, illnesses like malaria and all that. And you know what he did? He took, like, certain uh, soldiers and he put them, like, in one tent with, like, a certain kind of mosquito and he put, like, another, you know, soldier in another tent uh, with uh, basically – uh, another mosquito, and the ones that died, basically, that's the mosquito causing it. <laughs> poor, poor, poor soldiers, I guess they got that died from it. But basically, they start figuring out like some mosquitoes cause some, you know, illnesses. Basically, and that that enables them later to figure out more of a way uh, to eradicate, you know, illnesses like that. They find out that quinine, uh, yeah, quinine, I think quinine, as they call it, uh, is a good, you know type of drug that can, you know, cure malaria. And I think some people think it can be used to, to cure COVID. I think it's like some, some people think also. So interesting about that. So, so that's who Walter Reed is uh, and who, of course, uh, he, of course, is famous for. So, um, yeah, one thing, of course, Spanish-American War, you know, uh, that was the total cost, $250 million. That's all it cost. Basically, it's a pretty cheap war if you compare it to other wars that were fought, you know, later, uh, more or less. And like I said, most people die from disease. That may have been right. 380, that might be more of the correct. I see different numbers on how many people died, but not that many people died in the war, uh, which is interesting about that uh, when it comes to, like, fighting actual battles uh, and things like that. So, so that's one thing. And, uh, of course, there, of course, is the Treaty of Paris. That's the treaty, of course, that ended the war, which was finalized in Paris, France, uh, in December of 1898. Uh, you can see uh, that um, there's Emilio Aguinaldo, uh, who I think was at one point, like they tried to put him in as president, but I think later he was kind of exiled uh, for a while. And um, what happened was, the um, Spanish were given $20 million uh, for us to basically take over Puerto Rico, uh, the Philippines, Guam, also Wake Island. You can throw in that list uh, as well. Uh, they gave up Cuba, but Cuba became, like I said, independent uh, as a whole. Philippines, of course, won't be independent until later. I told you until after World War II. However, there was a stipulation, if you know about it, they have this thing called the Platt, yeah, the, not, yeah, the, the Platt Amendment that came out. Yeah, the Platt Amendment. Uh, and um, the Platt Amendment was this agreement that the U.S. would be allowed to go in politically, economically, and control Cuba because uh, it's so close to the United States, you know, close to like Florida and all that, uh, in exchange for their independence. Uh, and um, we also got military bases, like naval bases out of it, like Guantanamo Bay, which is on the eastern part of the island. Uh, and so that was all basically something that kind of came out of, of of the whole end of the war, uh, more or less, because for years we controlled Cuba uh, down there uh, for a long time, uh, up until like probably until Castro comes in. We pretty much have some kind of some kind of influence down there, uh, more or less. Or we back various mostly right wing dictators uh, in Cuba up to that guy Batista. I think that that ruled until Castro overthrew him in the Cuban Revolution. But like I said, yeah. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, we also took over the Samoan Islands. You ever heard of those? Yeah, Samoan Islands. We got we got control of that uh, as well. So the U.S. is pretty much you know cementing its you know imperial power. It's, you know, military muscle uh, in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, uh, in parts of Latin America. Of course, a lot of people in Latin America don't like this, uh, as you know later, uh, but we start to, of course, gain more power, like I said, uh, as an imperial power. 
So that's pretty much, you know, kind of what happened, you know, after the war, uh, more or less. Uh, and um, so pretty, pretty, it was a pretty big, you know, splendid war. A little spin, a little, yeah, spend a little war, you know, because of what happened with the outcome of it and all that. Right. The other thing I need to talk about, too, of course, today uh, is um, the United States uh, also had different policies imperial wise dealing with Asia, like China uh, and all that. And um, starting, I guess, sometime after the Spanish American War, um, what was going on in uh, Asia at the time uh, was that in China, uh, which was controlled by the Qing dynasty, you know about this, the um, European powers were starting to carve up China, like you know, imperial-wise and all of that. And uh, in China, they had what they call the Opium Wars that were fought between the British uh, and the Chinese Qing dynasty at the time. They lost the war, if you know about this, and they had this harsh treaty called the Treaty of Nanking that was signed in 18, 1842 uh, between the British uh, and um, uh, China. And so what happened was the, the British ended up with these treaty ports where they could uh, trade with the Chinese uh, and all of that. Hong Kong really wasn't one of them. Later it will, of course, controlled by the British. But I think originally it controlled by Canton and Shanghai, which I think were the two most famous cities that were found it mostly on the east coast of China and all that. And so the Americans became very fearful that what was going to happen uh, in uh, Asia, especially in China, was that basically all the European powers like Britain were going to go in, carve it up. And we wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Uh, and so under William McKinley, uh, Secretary of State John Hay issued this thing called the open door policy, uh, which basically said that all nations should keep all these treaty ports open so that everybody can trade, like uh, equal trade uh, and all that. It was issued in March of 1900. And so that's one of the things that the United States tried to do uh, under McKinley and later, I guess, under Teddy Roosevelt and all that, is trying to keep an equal footing uh, with trade as an imperial power, you know, with all these other countries that are going also uh, into there as well. Now, the other thing that's very famous, too, at the time, too, that we, we were kind of involved in was the so-called Boxer Rebellion, which you may have heard of, uh, that's well known, uh, about 1900, around 1900, uh, more or less. And uh, so, yeah, the Chinese don't like all this imperial stuff going on. Uh, they don't like Christianity coming in uh, into their country. Uh, if you know about China, uh, they're very uh, anti-foreign, xenophobic. They're anti-Christian, anti-Muslim. This is still today. China hasn't changed that much, uh, more or less. Uh, and so you start getting this um, anti-imperialism kind of movement going on, uh, and it leads to what they call a insurrection that they nicknamed later the so-called Boxer Rebellion, uh, which broke out mostly in Peking or Beijing, uh, in, of course, China. It was led by these Chinese nationalist groups that went by all kinds of names, which you see on the right, uh, such as the so-called patriotic harmonious fists. That was one name. I think they sometimes called it uh, uh, overall. Uh, other names that were popular too, I think the Society of the Righteous uh, was another one. Uh, and then some people called them boxers, like a lot of Westerners did this. And they called them that because uh, if you know about, you know, in China, they got Kung Fu, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and so you've got a lot of, you know, martial arts, Chinese people fighting with that kind of stuff, like Bruce Lee later, you know. Uh, and so I guess they experienced that. I guess it didn't work, but it gets bullets. <laughs> Kung Fu, <laughs> that did work. Uh, so anyway, um, basically that's where the term boxer, I think they would put their hands up like this, like they're going to fight. And so the term boxer kind of evolved from that, of course, later. So what happened was uh, something like eight countries went in there, U.S., you know, France, Britain, Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary, Japan, and Russia all sent forces in there basically to crack down on the insurrection, which took a couple of years. I think 1901, I think it finally came, came to an end, basically. But they do think that it weakened China, uh, the Boxer Rebellion. China was never the same after that. And so in 1912, you know about it, the last emperor of China, 
step down of the Qing dynasty. Uh, and it led to the Republic of China being founded in 1912. The guy's name was uh, Sun Yat-sen. He was one of the founders and fathers of the Republic of China. And they're a republic until 1949 when the People's Republic of China takes over under Mao Zedong, which is now a socialist republic, communist country, really, of course, still, I guess. So that's kind of what's happening. Yeah, we were, we also went to Japan. Like, I think around this time, uh, by the 19th century, we start trading with the Japanese uh, also as well in some of their ports. Uh, so we're starting to do that also as well as a world power uh, overall. All right, the next thing I need to get into, of course, is, of course, we're going to move on and we're going to, of course, talk about the uh, so-called, you know, Teddy Roosevelt era uh, today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that. Uh, of course, one of the first things I'm going to get into today is I'm going to talk about how Teddy Roosevelt, you know, came to power, which is, you know, kind of unique. Uh, he, of course, you know, basically came to power because William McKinley got assassinated uh, and all that. Uh, and uh, prior to that, uh, what had happened, if you know about that, was in uh, 1900, uh, William McKinley ran for re-election. Uh, remember, he had defeated William Jennings Bryan in 1896 in a close election. And uh, what happened was uh, McKinley was re-elected in a landslide. I think he got two-thirds of the electoral votes uh, in that election. Bryan, by the way, ran three times, ran also in 1908. Uh, later on as well. And, but, you know, and Brian tried to run on the same thing as he ran in 1896, you know, like the silver issue and all that. Uh, but nobody wanted to listen uh, because the economy was doing so well. And of course, as you know, basically the war, Spanish American war had given us so much prestige, you know, yet Teddy Roosevelt, the war hero, people weren't really thinking about, you know, anything negative like that. Uh, and so there was no chance. Uh, Brian, of course, uh, easily, you know, lost uh, to, of course, I think here's here's basically, uh, of course, yeah, there's McKinley and Roosevelt, of course, who ran. And uh, if you know about it, um, what happened in uh, 1900, uh, McKinley decided that he needed a new running mate uh, to run uh, for uh, re-election. And so he picked Teddy Roosevelt uh, as his VP nominee who at that point, you know, was a big war hero because of being a rough rider fighting in Cuba, San Juan Hill. And also he had become a successful governor of New York. He got elected uh, right prior, right after that. Uh, I think in 1899, I think he was elected governor of New York. And Teddy Roosevelt was a, you know, pro reformer. So he kind of wanted to put him on the ticket because McKinley was more like a big business guy. Like he's more pro industry. And then Teddy was this kind of, reformer, progressive guy, he thought that would be good on the ticket with him, uh, basically. But nobody realized that what would happen was that, you know, McKinley would get shot, and then Teddy Roosevelt would end up being president. That was something that was quite shocking, you know, of course, that would eventually happen. So that's one thing, of course, we're going to talk about today a little bit for a few minutes is I'm going to kind of get into, and I'm going to talk about what happened with the assassination. Well, what happened was McKinley in 1901, he'd only been president a few months, like re-elected, re uh, and he went to this uh, exposition called the Pan American Exposition, which was in Buffalo, New York, September 6, 1901. And he was in this uh, building there called the Temple of Music. And he was kind of greeting a bunch of, you know, guests. You know, they were coming up to him, shaking his hand and all that. And there was this man named uh, Leon Cholgosh. I'll put him on the screen, which is right here. Uh, he had this bandage that was wrapped around his, um, like his hand, like his right hand, I guess it was. Uh, nobody thought there was a gun in it, but there was. It was a revolver inside the bandage, basically. And when he stepped up to basically, like he was going to shake McKinley's hand, he fired two shots at him, like two bullets, basically. Uh, and, of course, what happened was it, McKinley was wounded. Uh, and, of course, a few days later, it's September 14th, McKinley died. Uh, and so uh, McKinley basically, uh, with his death, that basically leads to Teddy Roosevelt becoming president uh, at the age of only 42. 
Uh, he's the youngest president uh, to ever become, you know, into that office. Basically, I think second is um, John F. Kennedy. I think was a little older after that. Uh, he's the youngest to be ever, ever be you know, at least not elected, but the youngest to actually hold the office uh, when he came into power because he's not not elected outright, you know, in election until 1804. Excuse me, 1904, the 1904 presidential election. So that's how that's how he came into power. Uh, by the way, Cholgosh was found guilty of the murder. He was an anarchist who they think was originally from Poland, I believe it's correct. He'd come to America. He was an immigrant. I believe he was a steel worker, if not mistaken. And uh, he was eventually put on trial for it. And later in the year, I think, I want to say in October, they executed him. <laughs> Back in those days, you yeah, got found guilty of murder. They, they killed you in a couple couple months, maybe at the most. They didn't wait long. And um, anyway, um, what happened because of the death of McKinley, you know, the third president to be assassinated uh, and all of that after Lincoln and Garfield, what happened was the Congress asked basically the Secret Service to full-time protection uh, to to basically the president and the White House and all that. And so that's something that they started doing, the Secret Service, after that. Uh, previously, the Secret Service was mostly used to crack down on counterfeiters. I think that was the main thing, which they still do today. Uh, but they started then doing, you know, presidential protection uh, for the president, his family and relatives and things like that. So uh, anyway, so that's basically how Teddy Roosevelt, like I said, came to power. Here's another picture, of course, of, of um, Joel Gosh, of course, shooting him with a concealed revolver. That's pretty, pretty funny how he did that. It's not funny for McKinley, but it's funny how he was clever about that, I guess, with that. All right, I want to get in next, of course, like I said, we've got a few minutes. I can also discuss, you know, the uh, – Te uh, Theodore Roosevelt administration that comes in next. Uh, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt um, will be president from 1901 to 1909. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, of course, talk a little bit, of course, a little history about, you know, his life, like a little biography background uh, about Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, you can see he was born in 1858, died in 1919. Uh, he was from New York. If you know about it, he's from a pretty wealthy family, the Roosevelt's. One of his distant, distant cousins, as you know later, uh, of course, was Franklin D. Roosevelt, who would later be president, you know, in the 1930s and 40s uh, overall. And um, he basically uh, stayed at Harvard. He went to Harvard, uh, and uh, he, I think, majored mostly. He was big in history. He loved history. I think he wrote several historical works. Uh, over time. Uh, he also was in, I think he majored history and politics, I believe. And later on, he did run for office early on, like New York State legislature, I think in the 1880s, but I think he didn't do much success with that. So he went to the Dakota, Dakota Territory uh, in the 1880s, where he uh, did a little cattle ranching and stuff like that. And then he also ran for uh, mayor of New York City in 1886, but lost. So early on, he was trying to become a politician, but he was really not successful uh, at all. And he wasn't really successful as a politician, sort of, until the 1890s. In 1895, he was elected the New York police commissioner, New York City, uh, which he was for about two, three years. And um, if you know about Teddy, he was very famous for being one of the founders of the New York Police Department, you know, the NYPD, uh, which is still around the day. So he helped to kind of establish it and develop it uh, when he was the New York Police Commissioner. Uh, then under McKinley's administration, he became the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, was the other thing that he did as well. And then, of course, when the Spanish-American War broke out, he joined the Rough Riders, uh, and uh, that propelled him, as you know, uh, to great fame, uh, as a war hero. Uh, and, and then, of course, because of that, because he was a big war hero, he decided to run for governor of New York, uh, which he was elected in 1899. Uh, and then when, of course, McKinley ran for re-election in 1900, he became vice president in 1901, and he became president in 1901 
also as well. So this guy, well, it's like in a matter of like something like three, four years, went from, like I said, nobody to somebody. It's amazing how he did that, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. There's not too many presidents that have done. I think Obama did that kind of too. He was like this, you know, Obama was a senator that was like a dark horse, unknown. Most people didn't know him unless you were in Illinois or whatever, uh, but kind of like that. Uh, he was kind of a dark horse like that as well. Uh, Teddy had different nicknames. They called him, of course, Theodore's is, you know, name he goes by, but they call him TR, you know, about that. Teddy, uh, of course, uh, Hero of San Juan Hill. He called, and of course, the lion. I heard that, the term the lion. They called him as well. Of course, the trust buster is another name. That one, that, that second one, of course, Teddy, which is the most famous one uh, he's called. I don't know if you know where that came from, the term Teddy, uh, but there's a story where, I think he was out hunting like bears or something like that. And uh, they couldn't find a bear for him to shoot. And so they found this little bear cub. And they tied it to a tree. They said, shoot that. And he wouldn't. And so the joke was, Teddy, they called him Teddy after that because he wouldn't shoot it. But what happened over time, if you know about it, they started making teddy bears, you know, about that, uh, which were basically him. That's where it came from. Uh, it's basically Teddy Roosevelt, teddy bears. And so that's where the teddy bear came from. It was named after him. So anyway, that's the story of like his early life and you know how he became president uh, and all that. Now, let me get into and kind of talk about uh, some of the things that he was known for, of course, uh, as president. Here's some more stuff about his early life if you want to look at it. He had a lot of uh, illnesses like asthma, which was like a real bad problem that he had. He had also bad eyesight. I don't know if you know about that. And he had to wear like real thick glasses uh, and all that. So Teddy. But um, let me get into some things he was known for uh, early on. There was one thing, I guess the most first thing he really did uh, that was well known uh, early in his career uh, was he was the one that kind of got involved with the, um, it's called the uh, they call it either the 1902 coal strike or also called the 1902 anthracite strike that happened in Pennsylvania. It's like the first issue he dealt with as president, which kind of made him famous. And what happened was the United Mine Workers Union, uh, led by John L. Lewis, went on strike. They wanted like better wages. Uh, they wanted uh, less longer hours. They want, yeah, they wanted less hours, like instead of like 10 hours, whatever it was. They wanted eight or nine hours instead. They wanted shorter, shorter work day. They also wanted to be recognized because nobody, nobody was really recognizing them as a union uh, and all that. Uh, and so um, what happened was uh, he came in and started to basically force both sides, like the mine owners uh, in the union, to kind of negotiate. And so they met in the White House at one point. It was the first case where the White House arbitrated with some kind of different groups there. It was on you know both sides pretty much because previously most presidents, presidents would take up one side versus the other. In this case, basically he was kind of a neutral party. Uh, and it was also the first case where the federal government uh, gave some kind of support to workers in the unions. That's something that's kind of unique uh, about, about that uh, with Teddy Roosevelt, uh, more or less. Uh, they did get stuff out of it. They got like a shorter work day. I think they went from I think it was reduced to eight or nine hours, I think it was. And then, of course, they got like a 10% pay increase or something like that. Uh, they didn't get recognized. I don't think they got recognized. I think that was one that they didn't get. Uh, but um, that was something that kind of, you know, uh, came out of it. Um, I think they got nine hours instead of eight that they wanted. But that's basically what they got. Uh, the other thing that he's known for, too, I think, of course, they talk about Teddy's nickname uh, that he's called, which is a so-called trust buster. Uh, he's very famous for it, where he broke up a bunch of trusts, uh, basically. And there was one that he broke up that was very, very famous, which was called the, um, they call it the uh, Northern Securities Company, which was this um, trust, business trust that controlled a bunch of railroads up in the Northwest and Pacific areas. Uh, and uh, it was like J.P. Morgan, I think, owned part of it and all that. Uh, and what happened was they used the Sherman Antitrust Act to break up some of these business trust. That was very vital because it later led to basically uh, some of these other 
companies being broken up because of it. They think they think that that Northern Securities, it was like a Supreme Court case, Northern Securities versus like the United States uh, that eventually broke it up uh, and a bunch of others. And so Standard Oil would be, you know, eventually broken up because of some of the things that he started doing uh, as president uh, at that time. So that's that's widely influential, uh, what he did with that. But the only thing about Teddy Roosevelt, uh, if you know about it, he was kind of controversial with the trusts. He would sometimes only break up what he thought was bad trusts, and he would keep the good trusts. So some people didn't like that, uh, about that. Uh, but that's something he was known for, uh, being one of the first pro-presidents that really you know would try to break up trusts. And so a Taft. William Howard Taft that would come in after as president would also break up, break up trusts, which Standard Oil was one of those companies that was broken up, of course, when he was president overall. So he's very, very famous for that um, pretty much uh, overall. Now, the other thing he's known for, too, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, is his so-called square deal. Uh, he's very famous for which uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, ran on as kind of like a platform um, in 1904 when he eventually ran for re-election outright. Uh, and the square deal was this promise that Teddy Roosevelt made to basically help out all Americans. It didn't matter who they were, whether they were basically, you know, big business uh, or like the railroads uh, or small business or just average people. Uh, you know, average Americans, he was going to try to give everybody the same deal, you know, pretty much. Uh, and um, he was very popular. Teddy Rose was very, very popular, uh, you know, uh, in power. Uh, he um, would often give like, you know, very bombastic speeches, you know, like you see like his hands kind of outreached like that, uh, like you're seeing right there. And a lot of his ideas were very progressive. He was one of the first presidents that was a kind of a progressive and pro-reformer uh, that came in uh, at that time that was kind of part of the progressive movement. And his square deal was known for basically having these three main ideas, which they sometimes called the so-called three C's, uh, as they nicknamed it, you know, three C's. And uh, the three C's uh, were basically um, – Right here, conservation of the natural resource. That's one thing he wanted to do. He had heard about the Wisconsin idea, and so they were kind of trying to do that, just like in Wisconsin. Corporate control of big business, of course, try to crack down on them and control them. Consumer protection, which I've already talked about before. Uh, we were talking about progressivism and all that that started in the 1800s. And uh, so, yeah, Food and Drug Act, FDA, Meat Inspection Act, all those things, of course, you've heard of later, of course, uh, were, of course, all that happened under Teddy Roosevelt, uh, like because of the jungle and other books that were coming out that showed all the corruption and problems that were in the industries and so on. So um, now Teddy would run, by the way, for president against uh, the Democrat Alton Parker, who was from New York. He was actually a, this um, like a jurist or judge. I think he was the like the, I want to say he was the New York Supreme Court judge. Uh, at the time. And, uh, but Parker uh, ran up against obviously a very popular man, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the square deal. Yeah. The square deal was, you know, real, real popular. As you know, that's where FDR gets the new deal and you got Truman with the fair deal. They're kind of copying, I guess, Teddy Roosevelt uh, with that. But uh, Teddy Roosevelt won a landslide. It was one of the greatest landslides since Abraham Lincoln defeated George McClellan in 1864. Uh, and so I think he got close to two thirds or whatever of the, of the, I think of the electoral college, I think it was, and I think the popular vote wasn't even close or whatever. Uh, but that, that election, of course, you know, cemented him, you know, for another four years uh, as president. You can see, like I said, he became the first non-elected president to seek a second term in office. Nobody had really ever done that before. Uh, more or less. Yeah, there's electoral votes, pretty lopsided, uh, pretty much. Didn't quite get two thirds, but almost getting close to that amount uh, that he won by. Uh, but um, Republicans didn't really like him, <laughs> believe it or not. 
Uh, they thought he was like too too reform minded, too progressive, uh, and all that. But um, but he'll he'll serve until of course 1909 uh, as president. Here's of course a map showing you uh, the election in 1904. Uh, you can see pretty much uh, that uh, the Solid South still holding uh, there with Parker getting pretty much most of the votes in the South. And you can see he won pretty much all the West, Midwest, uh, North and Northeast. So pretty much pretty good there. You can see right there. All right. Yeah. Let me talk about a few more things about Teddy Roosevelt, uh, which of course uh, are well known uh, as well. Also, um, he was also known for his conservation policies, something that kind of started uh, under Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and um, he was big on that. Uh, and um, basically at the time when Teddy came in, uh, the United States at the time only had something like, I want to say 30, 40 million acres of forest land that was under control uh, by the federal government. Uh, if you know about it, I think I want to say close to about, I think at one point they said 800 million um, acres of forest land existed in the in where the United States is, like in the lower 48 uh, at one point. I think only 200 million still existed or something like two, 300 million, I think was still around uh, at the time. Uh, and so what he's going to do, he's going to set aside a lot of it uh, to basically be controlled by the federal government. Uh, so it doesn't all get cut down uh, like it most of it was before. Uh, and he was heavily influenced by this man named John Muir, who you see a picture of on the right. Uh, John Muir, if you ever heard of him, was this uh, naturalist who was from Scotland. He came to America and he fell in love with the United States. Uh, he was famous for um, traveling all over the United States. I think he's famous for this book, uh, which was called a Thousand Mile Walk to the Gulf, you may have heard of. Uh, and uh, he was also the founder of the Sierra Club, which I think was founded, I want to say, in the 1880s. And the Sierra Club was this uh, organization that was there to try to preserve, like, America's, like, you know, forests and everything. Uh, and uh, also another thing about uh, John Muir, uh, he was also considered the so-called father of the national parks. He helped kind of develop them. And uh, he was, like I said, he was really more of this naturalist that wanted to preserve everything. Uh, he really didn't, he didn't, he really wasn't a pro-conservationist because uh, conservationism, he still, you know, he might cut down trees or whatever uh, and all that, but he didn't want to cut down a tree, like no trees uh, and all that. Kind of like in California, they won't cut down trees a lot, you know, things like that. Uh, but um, so so he was kind of important. And so Teddy Roosevelt went on to uh, found like a lot of national parks you may have heard of early on. It was in the early 1900s, like Yosemite National Park in California, Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. I've been to both those. Um, and then uh, also I've been to Devil's Tower as well in Wyoming. Uh, that's something you got to go see, Devil's Tower. Pretty neat. Uh, so all those were, were basically made, you know, national parks uh, in the United States. Uh, and, of course, other ones would follow, you know, also uh, as well after that. Uh, also, they had this thing under him called the um, so-called um, National Reclamation Act, uh, which was issued by Congress in 1902. That was something he was in favor as well. Uh, that was where basically any kind of money in the West where they sold public lands it would go to building like irrigation projects and dams uh, to help out farmers uh, in the West. Also later hydroelectricity, like, you know, hydroelectric dams uh, that would be built later, like the Roosevelt Dam, the Shoshone Dam. They later have the, the Boulder later called the Hoover Dam uh, as well. Uh, and um, if you know about the Southwest, if you've ever been there, went there a few years ago and know, um, there's a lack of water. Uh, and so they have to make all these different like artificial lakes, like Lake Mead, Lake Powell, uh, et cetera, you know, using dams and things like that. Hydroelectricity, of course. I think without those dams, you wouldn't have Las Vegas, you know, later on, you know, because they use the dams for electricity and all that. Um, so 
he helps, of course, to, uh, of course, do that. So those are some of the policies that, you know, were part of, I guess, the so-called square deal, which is right there. There's that quote, the labor union shall have a square deal. The corporation shall have a square deal. In addition, all private citizens shall have a square deal. So that's his plan for Americans. Uh, and he even was supportive of African-Americans. I don't know if you know this or not, but um, one of his great advisors was Booker T. Washington. He was one of his advisors. Uh, he was one of the first African-Americans to be invited to the White House. Uh, and so he also was kind of in support of some African-Americans, you know, as well uh, overall. But obviously, you know, equal rights and things like that is not going to come till later uh, at the time. So that's pretty much my, my lecture today uh, right now uh, on Roosevelt, uh, of course. Um, I'll, of course, continue more with Teddy Roosevelt next week, like next next Tuesday. I'll get into, I'll kind of wrap up the Teddy Roosevelt era. And I'll kind of talk about the period of like under uh, William Howard Taft, who's president, uh, and also Woodrow Wilson uh, that comes in. Uh, but this period up to like U.S. imperialism is going to be pretty much where your first exam is going to end. I think I'll tell you there's going to be only four topics, uh, which will be on the exam. I believe the first part will be on the age of like industry, like the rise of capitalism to the rise of like labor, farmers, organizations, uh, and of course the, uh, the populist movement, uh, then the progressive era. And then of course also uh, the period of imperialism up to like the Spanish American war and China and all that. So 1900, I think is going to be the cutoff of course for that, but I'll talk about it later next week about what specifically is going to be on the exam. So I'm still working on the exam right now, but it will not be up until Tuesday next week. So like I said, uh, y'all still have, of course, this Gilded Age Old West quiz to kind of wrap up. That's due this weekend coming up. So don't forget about, you know, doing that and getting that done, uh, of course. And um, if anybody, of course, has any comments, questions about, of course, this lecture, you know, let me know uh, about it. Uh, you can, you know, send me comments, questions, of course, about about whatever you want. Either this lecture or previous lectures, of course, on my channel. And that's it pretty much for today. So I will see y'all later. I uh, hope y'all have a good weekend uh, coming up. Uh, and I'll see you next Tuesday where I'll, of course, continue talking more about really the early 20th century uh, under Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, so I'll see you next Tuesday. So y'all have a good weekend. Y'all take care. Okay.